Primary Herpetic Gingivostomatitis Pop Quiz A 10-year-old male child named Ajo was brought to my OPD by his parents, complaining that he had not been eating and drinking properly for two days. I noticed that the child was irritable and uncomfortable. On extraoral examination, I observed that his cervical lymph nodes were palpable and he had a slight elevation in the body temperature. On intraoral examination, I noted diffuse erythematous shiny gingiva and the adjacent oral mucosa, gingival bleeding and small ulcers on the gingiva, labial and buccal mucosa, soft palate, pharynx, sublingual mucosa and tongue. Ulcers had shown a red raised margin with a grayish white center. Then I was clear that Ajo was unable to eat or drink anything as the ulcers were very sensitive to touch during activities such as toothbrushing, thermal changes, spices, fruit juices and coarse foods. The history and the characteristic clinical signs made me diagnose the case as primary herpetic gingivostomatitis. Confirmatory diagnosis can be established by virus culture, immunologic tests using monoclonal antibodies or DNA hybridization. But in these cases, diagnosis should be made as early as possible. If Ajo was in the initial stage, we would have seen distinct spherical gray vesicles. But by the time the case reached me, these vesicles had ruptured to form painful ulcers. Usually it takes about 24 hours for a vesicle to turn into an ulcer. We must differentiate this condition from other mimicking conditions such as necrotizing gingivitis, erythema multiforme, bullous lichen planus, disquamative gingivitis, and recurrent aphthous stomatitis. Necrotizing gingivitis is characterized by necrosis and pseudomembrane formation, which were absent in my case. In erythema multiforme, vesicles rupture to form a pseudomembrane, but not an ulcer as in Ajo's case. Skin lesions were also absent, which are common in erythema multiforme. Patches of linear grey lace-like lesions, characteristic of bullous lichen planus, were also absent in Ajo. I could also eliminate desquamative gingivitis as there was no peeling of the epithelial surface. In recurrent aptostomatitis, diffuse erythematous involvement of gingiva, and acute toxic symptoms are absent. Also, as the name suggests, painful mouth ulcers usually recur. On the other hand, Ajo reported a fever, cervical adenitis, and generalized malaise without a previous history of the characteristic ulcers. As I established the diagnosis, I spoke to Ajo's parents about primary herpetic gingivostomatitis. It is a viral infection of the oral cavity caused by herpes simplex virus type 1. It is most commonly seen in infants and children younger than 6 years. Most often, primary infection with the herpes simplex virus is asymptomatic and the virus may remain latent or hidden in the neuronal ganglia. Sunlight, trauma, fever and stress can trigger the latent virus and lead to secondary manifestations such as herpetic stomatitis, herpetic genitalis, ocular herpes, and herpetic encephalitis. They can also be seen on the palate, gingiva, or the adjacent mucosa. I informed them that the course of the disease is limited to 7 to 10 days, but gingival edema and erythema may persist for several days even after the ulcers heal. A large percentage of Bell's palsy cases may be caused by herpes simplex virus. It occurs when the peripheral nerve cell axon ruptures, where the HSV resides. 
Now let us move on with the case of Ajo. As the diagnosis was established within three days of onset, I prescribed a cyclovir, 15 mg per kg, five times daily for seven days, along with advising them to see a physician if the condition prolonged beyond two weeks. Now, how do we approach a case that has not sought medical attention early on? If it occurs more than three days after the onset, palliative care should be given. This includes removal of biofilm and food debris, an NSAID to reduce fever and pain, nutritional supplements, an application of topical anesthetic before eating to aid nutrition. The last acute gingival infection is the pericoronitis. Let me tell you about a case I managed at my clinic. A 28-year-old female patient named Isha came to my OPD, complaining of difficulty in mouth opening, foul taste, and pain in the ear, throat, and floor of the mouth. On examination, I noted red swollen gingiva covering the partially erupted mandibular third molar and food accumulation beneath the flap. Pus exudation was also noted. Then I proceeded to check the occlusion and observed that the opposing tooth was impinging on the swollen gingiva. I asked her if she had any hard foods recently. She told me that the pain started when she was having popcorn kernels and from then the area became extremely tender. I deduced that this acute involvement was triggered by trauma from the opposing tooth and the entrapment of the popcorn kernel. The inflammatory fluid and cellular exudate accumulated, increasing the flap's bulk and interfering with complete jaw closure. She also had a slight elevation in body temperature and was uneasy. I diagnosed the case as acute pericoronitis, which is the inflammation of the gingiva in the crown portion of a partially erupted tooth. The gingival flap overlying the crown is called a pericoronal flap or an opiculum. It is most commonly seen in partially erupted or impacted mandibular third molar. We can also see chronic cases where patients may not exhibit any clinical signs or symptoms. Let's see how I managed my patient. I gently flushed the area with warm water to remove the debris and exudate. I elevated the flap with the scaler and swabbed the area with an antiseptic. After removing the debris, I flushed the area with warm water again. I adjusted the tooth position to relieve the trauma and also remove the coronal soft tissue on the offending tooth. I did not prescribe any antibiotics as my patient was free of systemic complaints. I told the patient to come back once the acute symptoms have subsided so that a decision could be made whether to retain or extract the tooth. In the second visit, the patient was comfortable. As the tooth was impacted and could not come into the functional occlusion, I decided to extract the tooth. If incomplete repair takes place after the extraction of impacted third molars, bony defects may occur. The flap technique used to access these defects is the distal terminal molar flap. In cases where retention of the tooth is an option, excision of the operculum can be considered. This procedure is called operculectomy. This aids in preventing food accumulation and subsequent inflammation, thereby helping the patient to maintain oral hygiene. If pericoronitis is left untreated, it could result in various complications. The involvement can be localized in the form of a pericoronal abscess or may spread into the oropharyngeal area and medially to the base of the tongue, making it difficult for the patient to swallow. Additionally, the submaxillary, posterior cervical, deep cervical and retropharyngeal lymph nodes may be involved. Peritonsillar abscess, cellulitis and Ludwig's angina are the infrequent complications. This brings us to the end of our video. We hope you had fun learning with us.